Hi everybody, welcome back. We are on the CTF-1250 once again and we're getting ready to do the alignments now. So I'll give you a little rundown of what I've done since the last part that uh, we posted. And that is the any of the capacitors in the audio path, and there's probably maybe six or eight of them, I replaced coming from the tape head out to uh, the, the output of the little preamp to here. The other thing I did was I replaced these four potentiometers, the two for the main output level and the two for the equalization, out, you know, playback equalization uh, adjustments. So those four pots got replaced with 10K 10 turn pots. It's going to make it a lot easier for us to adjust this. Now when we start out, the first thing you have to do is connect your test equipment and what they want you to do is use a millivolt meter on the output of the tape deck and they want you to adjust the output level right here all the way to maximum they want you to max out the output level adjustment pots which are these two right here so we're going to turn those all the way to their maximum. The other thing is when you connect the test equipment to these jacks back here, they want you to make sure that it's terminated with somewhere anywhere from a 47K to a 52K resistor. So here's how I did it. Came out of the back of the amplifier or the tape deck with a set of coaxes with RCA plugs on the back. And since I have two millivolt meters. I'm using one for left channel, one for right channel. And what I did was I just took a couple of these dual banana jacks and I made up some 51k precision resistors, or at least pretty, you know, 1% or whatever, and put them in here and then I stacked this <laughs> BNC adapter into there and just plugged it into the meter. Now both of these meters have a really high uh, frequency where the where the AC will be correct. So this is these are both true RMS meters, but not only are they just true RMS, but they also can read AC voltages up to relatively high frequencies, higher than what we're going to be working with. Because remember, we're going to be going all the way up to about 20 kilohertz. So if you are using uh, your multimeter, make sure that you check the specs on your multimeter and make sure that the, the AC on this will operate up to that frequency. A lot of the little handheld meters will only go up to one kilohertz and some of them may be to you know, five or 10 kilohertz, but others will go clear up to like one megahertz and, uh, you know, or a hundred kilohertz. And, that's what you want to use on this. So these are set to read millivolt AC and we're using our trusty GL341 cassette and what we're going to do is we're going to adjust for the maxima or a uh, we're going to adjust the level of the output. Okay, there are two main frequencies in this first adjustment that we want to do, and uh, that's where everything is going to be set from. So the first thing we want to do is we want to go to 333 hertz, and we're using the STD-341A cassette. And the idea is we just want to take a baseline measurement. In other words, we don't care if both channels are exactly matched because you remember we maxed out these two pots here we maxed out the adjustment down here in the front and none of that's aligned yet we're only interested in just reading the raw value of the left and right channel at 333 hertz so let's move the meter over to here and let me make sure that the tape is set at the, at the correct place and then we'll start it up. 
Okay, if you notice right now, the two channels are operating. We have 752, or roughly 750, and this one's running at about 539, 540, something like that. So let's set this to, to non-auto range. Okay. So we're going to write these numbers down and then we're going to go to the 10 kilohertz and see what it looks like. Okay, you see we have it on there and we have 700 and around 750 millivolts on the top one. And on the bottom one we have 540 millivolts. And I'm writing those down. And then what we're going to do is we're going to switch, and you can see we have the, uh, the lower frequency on there right now, and the scope does not like <laughs> this tape. It picks up a lot of stuff on, uh, you know, on the uh, tape and everything. But anyway, let me get it over to the 10 kilohertz, and let's see, we should have the same or close uh, amplitude. If not, we're going to adjust these two pots right here. This one right here and this one that's kind of hidden behind the wires there right there. And we're going to adjust those so that they are the same at 10 kilohertz. The amplitude is the same at 10 kilohertz as it is at 333 hertz. And you can see they're both a little bit low, so we need to adjust them. So let's adjust the top meter first. We want 750 millivolts. And you can see you don't have to move it much uh, to get it to go up. And you run out of tape. There we go before you get it done. That's the other problem. And the bottom one was what? 540 millivolts. And whenever you move the pot it makes the signal jump around pretty severely. And you have to wait for it to settle and then when you run out of tape you have to rewind the tape again. That's it right there. I think we got it. I think that's pretty good. So it balanced out this is good. Okay, this is where the manual gets a little bit goofy. They tell you to use the STD341A tape, but I do not believe it has a 14 kilohertz tone on it. Um, so I put the other tape in with the 14 kilohertz tone, and we're trying to just make sure that as it steps through, they all stay in the same uh, range after we adjusted that EQ. So in theory this should track. So here's 14 kilohertz and you can see 540 and 7 it's jumping all over the place but roughly it's where we need it to be and the <laughs> you only get about 10 seconds so you really have to read quickly and it, you have to wait for that to stabilize. But I think we're in good shape. It looks pretty good. All right, this next part is where it's going to get a little bit more complicated. So the first thing we have to do is we're going to adjust the playback, playback level adjust. And that can be a little bit complicated uh, because of how they have you do this. So you have to read the instructions a couple of times to really figure it out. And this is the way that I'm doing it. I'm not sure if this is perfect and being that I have not worked on one of these models before, I could be off a little bit, but here's where I'm at. The first thing I did was to disconnect the output leads from the uh, from the tape deck, but I left the 50 ohm term or the 50k ohm terminations on there, so I just left it like that. I then put the probes directly into the meters 
and I connected them to the test points, uh, test point 20 and test point 21. You can see them kind of down in there. And they have you play the GL331A tape, and you're going to play the first track on the tape, which happens to be the 333 hertz at 0 dB. And what they want you to do is at that measuring point, they want you to adjust uh, while you're playing that track. They want you to adjust R103 and R104, which are your main outputs, which are these two pots that I replaced with the 10 turns. This one here and this one here. They now want you, where am I at? This one here and this one right here. And they now want you to adjust those with that track playing to 1.12 volts, which represents 1 dBV. All right, if that makes sense. So we're going to play the tape, and I've already tweaked this a little bit, so it should be pretty close. And you can see we have just about 1.12 volts. And it is very, very touchy. And it will move around ever so slightly. And, uh, but that's just the way it is. <laughs> so we have it tracking right now. Now the next thing we're going to do is we're going to put in a blank tape. And we're going to, and the reason we're, this is a blank tape, we don't want anything coming from the tape itself through the tape heads, okay? And what we want to do is we want to adjust, or we want to feed a signal from a signal generator of 333 hertz into the, uh, these two test points. And they want you to feed them into test point five and test point six, which if you look over here, let me lock you in. It's really hard to see around all these wires, so I apologize, but TP, let's see where we're at. TP5 is right here, and TP6 is hidden, where was it? Back in here somewhere. Right here, TP6, right here, I'm touching it. I don't know if you could see it behind all those wires, but trust me, it's there. And I'm using my two-channel signal generator. Now, I'm assuming that if you don't have that, they just ha you just would use, you'd feed the signal into one channel and adjust it, then feed it into the other channel and adjust it. But since I have a two-channel signal generator, uh, I'm going to just feed both channels at once so I can it just make it easier to adjust. So... Let me get on to this difficult to find test point six. Disappeared on me again. There it is. And let me connect the ground. Okay. So now you see we have a big mess of wires. So we have a goes into and we have a goes out of. <laughs> and the first thing we want to do is we want to adjust the output level, or adjust that, the output level of the signal generator. So up here, I have my signal generator. There's my two outputs. I'm going to adjust this output until, on those same test points we were checking with the tape earlier, we want to see about 710 millivolts, which is minus 3 dBV. So we're going to start the tape, start the test points. And you can see, adjusting it, that was as close as I could get it between the two channels. Because once again, my, my, uh, my signal generator does not have a fine enough adjustment. So, what I might be able to do, though, is put some attenuators in there. Let me see if I can do that. 
Okay, even with signal attenuators, that's just as good as you can get it. It's just so touchy. So, about just about 709. So, just a teeny little bit under. And this one's sitting at 711, almost 712. So, they're both within, you know, just a slight amount. So, I think we'll be okay. We're now going to move our meters from those two test points to the input jack or to the uh, yeah to the input jacks or I'm sorry to the output jacks so we're gonna move all right <laughs> a lot of things are happening here so we're gonna move this to the detent all right the output level. They have you have it maxed out for all the other tests. Now we're going to set this to the deep. There's a detent right here at number six. We're then going to take the probes for our two millivolt meters and we're going to put them on the outputs, or I mean on the, uh, yeah, on the line out connectors right on the connector itself so this all sounds kind of convoluted but this is what the book is telling us to do so I said you have to read it a couple times to understand what they're trying to tell you all right we're then going to start our blank tape up again and with that calibrated signal in there the output should be 447 millivolts. And you can see where we are. We're pretty close right now. And here's the problem. These two potentiometers I did not replace. They are single turn pots. So I think if I move these around too much, they're going to jump substantially. And you can see I just moved that one on the bottom. very hard to get it adjusted. There we go. That's it. And then this other one here, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get that to see just touching it makes it jump. But that's pretty close. That's about as good as I'm going to get it without replacing those pots with 10 turn pots. And again, I don't think this is quite as critical as you might think. I mean, it is critical, but I think if you're off by, you know, a fraction of a millivolt, I don't think that's going to make the biggest difference in the world. So that should be pretty close. Considering these are single turn pots, I just don't think they want you to, they're expecting it to be that accurate. They just want it as close as it can be. And if you look on the oscilloscope, I'm just kind of monitoring the signal you can see they're right on top of one another and that's really what we're interested in. They're in phase and they're right on top of one another so we have a pretty balanced, pretty much balanced output. Everything tracks off of this adjustment that we did up to this point. If these things are not working properly then nothing else is going to work. <laughs> it's just not. So that's pretty much it. Now, the uh, from that this point on, we are going to be able to go in and do the Dolby and the meter adjustments and so forth. But all of those are dependent upon these settings. At least what I was made to understand. All right. For the next adjustment, we're going to hook our little. Uh, millivolt meters to TP40 and TP41 and we're going to then feed onto the into the input of the record inputs which is you know these jacks right here we're going to feed a 333 Hertz signal at 316 millivolts RMS which is the same as minus 10 dBV and you're going to feed that into there and then you're going to adjust this record level knob 
until you get 710 millivolts on those test points 40 and 41. And you can see I have it as close as I could possibly get it. So we have that set right now. Now, the next thing they want us to do is turn VR801 and VR802 on the display amplifier unit in a clockwise direction from min and stop at the point where the level meter position reaches 0 dB. Shut off the line input volume to 0 and raise the input of the, in, of the line input terminals. And you want to confirm that when the level meter readout is at negative 20 dB, or minus 20 dB, the meter displays minus 23, plus 3, or minus 2 dBV. 100 millivolts to 94 millivolts. When the level meter is at 5 dB, plus 5 dB, millivolt meter displays 1 volt to 997 millivolts. Okay, so we have our 710 and we want to adjust VR801 and VR802 until the level meter says 0 dB and we're off by a good bit if you look right here okay here we go so we're gonna adjust these two little pots up here until we get 0 dB so right there and right there. Again, really touchy. Now, what they're saying is to shut off the line input volume to zero. What, <laughs> that's exactly what it says. Shut off the line input. Here, I'll put it, show it to you. Shut off the line input volume to zero and raise the input of the line input terminals. Confirm that when the level meter readout is at minus 20 dB, the meter displays minus 23, which is 100 millivolts approximately. So I'm not sure what they're talking about. I think what they're saying is go down to 100 millivolts <laughs> and you should see uh, you should see minus 23. I think that's what they're trying to say. So I'm going to go back up to my meter and we're going to move that down to a roughly 100 millivolts and it says it can be anywhere from 100 millivolts to 94 millivolts. So we're going to move this down to about 100 millivolts. Tricky, tricky. Right there. And the these there's two pots and they're both adjust like independently adjustable. And my meter's drifting or my <laughs> camera mount's drifting. And so the two input pots, they don't track linearly with one another at all. So we have to uh, adjust those independently until we get 100 millivolts. And you can see it's still not right. I've got to go a little bit more yet. All right, that's as close as it gets. I'll show you what's going on here. These this is there's actually two pots here front and back and they're very tightly uh, connected and you can turn them independently of one another and they again they're just normal potentiometers and they just don't track evenly with one another so anyway they're saying with 100 millivolts it should say minus 20 db and what do we have lo and behold minus 20 dB and then they're saying when we're at 1 volt it should say plus 5 dBV so I'm gonna move the millivolt meter up now I'm gonna turn this until on my millivolt meter 
I have one volt. And you could see the pot does not track very equally. So the one is a little bit low and the other one is a little bit high. Let's see here. And I'm going to have to mess around with it again. It, this is the thing about these that can be so difficult. So at one volt, it should read plus 5 dB and the millivolt meter displays 2 dB, which is 1 volt to 997 millivolts. And you can see it's a little bit low. To get up to this one here, I'm at 1.07 volts, but it's very, very close. So it is tracking relatively linearly, and I'm sure that this pot up here is very touchy. Yeah, look, I just barely put my finger on it. It, it moved. So that's probably what it is. Oh, there you go. I'm going to leave it like that. We're pretty good. So it's all working. Everything seems to be working just fine. So there's our meters and we're done with that. So now from now on we can use these meters accurately to measure our output of our tape because now we first set the preamp, then we set the equalizing amp, then we set the output amplifier, then we set the meters to match all of that. Does that make sense? Everything was based on the output record level of the cassette that we're using, the test cassette. So if this cassette is not right, if it was recorded incorrectly, all of those adjustments are going to be totally wrong. There's no way that you can set this without having the proper test tape. <laughs> it's just the way it works. Okay, this unit has a separate erase head over here. And the next thing the instructions are going to have us do is adjust the erase current. Now the test point that we're going to look at, one millivolt equals one milliamp of erase current. So that's the that's the scale. What they want you to do is adjust or is go on to pins 102 and 103, test point 102 and 103, which is down in there. I don't know if you can see it or not. Right there you can see the meter. Everything's buried. But 102 and 103 are right in here. Right there. And we're going to set the millivolt meter for 160 millivolts, which means 160 milliamps of erase current. And all we do is put a blank tape in and start recording. And the idea is you want absolutely no signal going into the tape deck. So I'm disconnecting everything and I'm going to hit the record. And that's pretty darn close. We wanted 160 millivolts. We have 157.2. I don't think I'm going to touch that. It's a single turn pot once again. So it's from the factory after 40 years, it's still right on. The next thing we're going to adjust is our bias trap. Now what is a bias trap, you may ask? Well, without talking about hysteresis of tape hysteresis and different things like that, it's kind of, there's a lot to explain about it, but most of you who work on tape decks understand what bias is and so forth. A bias signal is a high frequency signal that's higher than what you can hear with your ears. In many cases, it's somewhere around 100 kilohertz. It's a very high frequency. And it's very difficult to measure. And the thing is, you need that bias signal on the tape 
in order for it to record the audio frequencies properly, more linearly. If you don't have a bias frequency on there, the sound quality is going to be horrible because high frequencies and low frequencies record at different levels. In other words, they respond differently um, because of the way tape magnetizes and demagnetizes. <laughs> um, th that's an, a, could be a whole video in and of itself, and I know I'm not doing a really good job of explaining it. But suffice it to say, the first type of bias that was put on a tape head for recording was called DC bias. So you, you raise that, that tape head up to a certain DC level, and then you varied that DC level up and down uh, when, you know, with, you basically modulated that <laughs> signal um, from that offset. So you, you're putting like an offset onto the tape. And AC bias is much better. It has more linearity, lower distortion, lower noise, so forth and so on. And the idea is that bias signal is a very high frequency, like a hundred kilohertz signal, that almost acts like a carrier signal for your, uh, for your audio. The thing is, you don't want that to bleed through the, to the outputs of the tape deck and go into your amplifier. You don't want to feed a 100 kilohertz signal into your amplifier, especially when you're recording. So what they do is they put a, a little filter circuit in there called a bias trap, and you tune it just like you would tune a, a trap circuit in a, a radio. And what that's going to do is it is going to kind of like notch out that 100 kilohertz signal so that it doesn't pass through uh, to the outputs. So what we're going to do is there's there's two levels of filtration that they have in the bias trap. So the first one, they're going to have us start recording with no, no signal. In other words, you're just recording a blank signal onto a blank tape. And we're going to take the first level of bias trap out. So, so you can see the bias signal on an oscilloscope. And it's still going to be difficult to see. Then we're going to take the second level of bias trap, we're going to null it out. In other words, we're going to minimize that signal as much as we can. Then we're going to go back to that signal we turned up and turn it back down. You'll see when I do it. So what we're going to adjust is these four little coils. They look like IF cans out of a uh, radio, right? See them? One, two, three, four. And the first ones we're going to do is these two. To, to allow the bias signal to be seen on the scope on our TP20 20 and 21 once again. And then we're going to adjust these two here and here for minimum signal. Then we're going to go back to these and set for minimum signal again. And the idea is to get rid of that 100 kilohertz signal altogether. All right, so let's go up to our scope. Hope that makes sense. And I hope this will work for you. All right, turning on record, and you can see the bias signal is pretty tiny right now. So, but let's go to channel one, our first channel, and you see how as I turn it, that signal gets really big. This scope is looking at a very high frequency right now, and we'll go to the other channel. We'll turn it up. And you can see there's your bias signal, okay? Now what we're going to do is I'm going to drop this amplitude a little bit. And I'm going to adjust the other two coils to minimize this. I want to make the amplitude as low as possible. So you can see right there. See how I pass through it and it starts going back up? So right there is about your null point. Then we're going to go to the other one, set it down. It was pretty close, but you could see we did get some adjustment out of it. Okay. Then we're going to go back to those pots that we turned up, and we're going to null them out now. I'm going to turn this back up, and I'm going to bang the camera while I do so. 
I'm going to turn this back down and you can see it just kind of fades into nothingness and that's what we want and then go to the other channel and it fades into nothingness and you see when you pass through that null point it starts to climb again all right our bias trap is now set and I know that's very hard to see but that's how you do it okay the, I think this is a good place to stop with this part um, for a couple of reasons number one the the rest of the procedure is going to drag on for probably another hour or two believe it or not there's that much left to do second of all we have to make sure we have the correct tape now Pioneer had a specific blank tape that they supplied for doing this alignment because the formula of the tape for standard metal chrome and ferrochrome are very specific and uh, any of you who uses tape decks regularly uh, already knows that just because a tape says standard you know standard bias tape doesn't mean anything you can take two different standard bias tapes from two different manufacturers and you can get two totally different results so we have to make sure we have the right cassette to do this alignment and uh, if we do not we're going to have to learn how to improvise with the tape that we have so all of this is very important because the next thing we're going to be setting is making sure these knobs are doing what they're supposed to be doing and uh, and then last but not least the final part would be to adjust the Dolby uh, again you can't do Dolby noise reduction until all of this stuff is working and tracking properly so that's another big procedure so I'm gonna take some time and try to make sure I have the correct type of blank tape I'm going to read through the directions a few times and try to get a feel for what they want to, to do. And then once I do, I'll, we'll be back with another video and we'll complete the alignment of this cassette deck and hopefully we'll be okay. I think we can all agree by now that I think the head on this cassette deck is good. It seems to be tracking pretty well. Uh, there was one part that I skipped that I missed uh, recording and that was when you when you finish doing the uh, let's see go back a couple pages the equalizer adjustment uh, they also wanted you to take the switch and move between metal chrome and ferrochrome and at 10 kilohertz it shouldn't drop more than about minus 4.3 uh, to minus 5.3 dB and I did check that and it is just on the barely on the edge of passing but it does pass it's working and again part of it could be because I didn't I still haven't aligned it as prop as perfectly as it could be but I think we're getting pretty close anyway <laughs> we're moving along and uh, until next time once again I wish you all peace joy happiness and good health and uh, Hopefully I can wrap this stupid thing up and get it off my bench on the, on the last video. Until then, take care and stay well. Bye-bye.